Well, good morning and welcome. For those of you who trickled in throughout the worship service and um, you got a communion um, element or you got the elements for communion, we're going to wait till the end of this service uh, this week to, to have communion. Just very briefly, I do want to remind you that we have at Calvary what we call an open communion. That means it's open to everyone who truly believes in the Lord Jesus Christ who've identified themselves as Christ followers, who've turned from their sin and received Christ as their savior. If that isn't you, then we would respectfully ask that you would refrain from communion because taking communion is really a declaration of love and loyalty to Jesus. And if you don't love him and, and you don't know him, then what you're doing is something other than what the point of communion is. What we're hoping is that you'll join us that you'll come into a right relationship with God through Christ, that you will believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Lord. This morning, it, the, the passage lends itself to what, for our communion later on. I'm entitling this morning's message, Lessons from the King's Diner. But I could just as easily have entitled it, Come Hungry. Leave full. <laughs> because that's what I'm hoping will happen this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do commit this time to you. Our hearts to you. Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts. And for the person who's come here hungry. Lord, we pray that they would leave full. Lord, for the person who has come here desiring spiritual nourishment, edification, freedom from guilt, opportunity to love you. Lord, we pray that they would be satisfied. Heavenly Father, we pray that we could eat deeply of the bread that has come down from heaven. We pray that we could drink deeply from the living water. Even as the Old Testament writer who said, Ho, oh, everyone who's thirsty, come to the water, come and drink. Lord, we pray that that's exactly what we would do and that our hearts would be filled and that we would be satisfied. In Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have had nothing to eat. And I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, where could we find enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks and broke them and gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave to the multitude so they all ate and were filled. And they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And he sent away the multitude. He got into the boat and came to the region of Magdala. This chapter has been full of meetings miracles and meals. At the beginning of the chapter, religious leaders accused Jesus of permitting his disciples to ignore their traditions in verses 1 through 20. Jesus condemns the religious leaders and accuses them of corrupting and twisting God's law in such a way that they wound up dishonoring God, breaking the law, Breaking the commandment to 
honor your parents in verses 3 through 9. Jesus has made it clear that the way they wind up dishonoring God, the law, and their parents reveals a problem that's inside of their heart. And so then he reminds them that it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles your heart. It's what comes out of your heart that is the problem. And so then Jesus performs the miracle of the brokenhearted mother in verses 21 through 28. And now he's going to feed a crowd of 4,000 plus people in verses 32 through 39. One of the things that I want to remind you of is that Jesus keeps visiting the theme that true religion comes from the heart. We believe in Jesus with our heart, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. We sing from the heart, Colossians three sixteen. We obey God from the heart, Romans six sixteen. We give from the heart, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. We pray from the heart, Psalm 51, 10. But we also care from the heart, chapter 15, verse 32. So in Matthew's gospel, we read about the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. Now there's another major manja meeting. Food, glorious food. The stories are so similar that it has caused some confusion among Bible students. Maybe even you, you, you might be thinking, didn't we just read this? And the answer is no. There's significant differences. In chapter 14, the audience is Jewish. In chapter 15, the audience are primarily Gentiles. The events in chapter 14 take place in the Galilee near Bethsaida. Here the events are in the Decapolis, Mark 8.31, in Gentile country. In chapter 14, Jesus feeds the multitude with five loaves and two fish. In this chapter, he feeds the crowd with seven loaves and a few fish. In chapter 14, Jesus was with the crowd one day. Here in chapter 15, Jesus is with the crowd three days. Jesus himself makes reference to each event as a separate event when he asks the disciples later in chapter 16, verses 9 and 10, do you not still perceive, do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 or the seven loaves for the 4,000? How many baskets you gathered? So he refers to it as separate events. What's interesting to me is I have a friend who's fairly convinced that Jesus may have had a weight problem. And I don't think he seriously thought through the theological implications of an overweight Jesus. But my friend rightly points out, he says, well, look at how much Jesus loved to eat. He's accused of being a wine bibber and a glutton. He feeds the 5,000 in chapter 14. He feeds the 4,000 in chapter 15. And before the cross, he has supper. After rising from the dead, Jesus basically winds up in the Galilee and has fish tacos. When he meets the disciples, he says, have you got any food here? And I'm willing to concede that Jesus loved food. But clearly Jesus loves people way more than he loves food. To my police officer friends, I always ask, do you know what cops love more than food? Free food, not donuts, free food. <laughs> and so, once again, we're invited to learn some lessons from the king's diner. Let's look at, at verse 32. It says, now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they've now continued with me three days and they have nothing to eat and I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Think about what Jesus just said. They have come to Jesus and they've experienced the healing that we looked at earlier in the chapter. 
Jesus says, I don't want to send them away empty. I want to send them away full. And the first lesson involves compassion. Jesus says, I have compassion. And we've already visited this word, but we probably need to visit it again. It's the Greek word, splankidzomai. It's an interesting word because it means visceral. It means in the inward parts. The ancients thought that the seat of their emotions was in their intestines and their bowels. Usually if you think about things or you feel things deeply. Have you ever heard the expression someone says, I feel like he kicked me in the guts. That's what it's talking about. Or if you feel like you're going to throw up, where is the location of your feeling? It's somewhere in the general vicinity of your navel. But aren't you glad that we actually have switched from intestines to heart? I mean, can you imagine at Valentine's Day, you get a card with a, like a, a, an intestinal tube on it, and you go, you know, it just isn't the same as a heart Valentine. And you're exactly right. So why does Jesus call the disciples to himself? Again, does he really need their help to perform the miracle? You know the answer is no. Jesus doesn't need their help. And by the way, Jesus doesn't need your help. The very fact that Jesus invites them and the very fact that Jesus invites you and me to participate in each other's lives says something about the heart of Jesus. So why include them? Well, again, the whole point of discipleship is to train others to do the work. But how do you train people to be compassionate? How do you invite compassion and care? Remember, someone has said that compassion is your pain inside my heart. Jeremiah wrote, it is the Lord's mercies that were not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, it says in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. But we often forget the context of Jeremiah's cry. The city of Jerusalem is burning. You can still smell the stench of the dead bodies all around you. And his life, as it used to be, has come to a dramatic end and Jeremiah in the rubble of what used to be his city cries out to God and he says great is your 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 your, your mercies your compassions they fail not he refuses to believe anything other than God is good when Jesus saw the crowds it says he had compassion for them in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. William Barclay writes, quote, Jesus teaches that human need must always be helped and that there's no greater task than to relieve someone's pain and distress and that the Christian's compassion must be like God's, unceasing. Other work may be laid aside, but the work of compassion never, unquote. It's Barclay's way of saying there's a lot of things that you can postpone, but there's one thing you should never postpone, and that's to look around you and to care. That's what he's saying. Compassion always includes action. Someone said that it is by compassion that we make other people's misery our own. By relieving them, we relieve ourselves in a very real sense. I think that that's true. You might come to a place in your life where the most satisfying moment isn't what someone has done for you, but what you've done for someone else. So what prompts Jesus' compassion? Well, the crowds have been with Jesus three days, it says, listening to him teach. 
They've been with Jesus. They've watched Jesus. They've observed the miracles. And by the way, the wording in the language doesn't necessarily mean that they've been without food for three days. Someone once said to me, I haven't had anything to eat for three days. And I said, no problem. I'm here to tell you food still tastes the same. That's not the answer he was looking for. It's his way of saying, I'm hungry. Can you help? I'm going to suggest to you that it's probably here it means not that they've been without food for three days, but that their supplies have been exhausted. The resources are gone. I'm going to suggest to you that probably that's what's happening in the text. The supplies have probably been exhausted, and now it's time to send the crowds home. And the concern of Jesus seems to be, don't send them away hungry. Send them away prepared for the journey. And it becomes a principle that each and every one of us can live with. When someone comes to you, they make contact with you. They're going to come to you either empty or full in need. Just like I'm fond of saying there's two kinds of people in the world. Those who have hope and those who need hope. And so Jesus wants to make sure that they're full and that they're prepared for the journey that's in front of them. And that's part of what we want to be able to do as a church. It's that you come to the church and maybe you are empty. Maybe you are in need. Maybe there's something inside of you that needs to be fulfilled. Earlier, Jesus fed the multitudes and they wanted to make him a king. But there's no such attempt in this episode. But Jesus cares about them. It's a reoccurring theme. And now look at verse 33, the disciples' incapacity to feed the multitude. It says, then his disciples said to him, where would we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Some scholars suggest that this event never happened. Their reason, the scholar said, for this sentence, they're thinking to themselves, the disciples have already seen Jesus feed the 5,000. Why would they doubt? Why would they ask such a ridiculous question? I'm here to tell you that I am somewhat sympathetic with the scholars and the skeptics question, why don't the disciples get it? It's a reasonable question, but their answer that, that ancient writers combined the text doesn't really answer the issue. By the way, these skeptic and liberal scholars don't really believe that the Bible is true. They don't really believe the textual narrative. I do. I believe that the Bible is authoritative, powerful, and real. And trustworthy. The disciples' answer may be an admission that they don't have the resources that they need in order to meet such a great need. I'm willing to concede that that's a possibility. But I'm going to suggest to you another explanation. An explanation in my world that seems to make a lot more sense. Because in order to get the resources from Gentile sources, they're going to have to defile themselves. These are Jewish disciples following Jesus who keep the, and observe the laws of kosher or, or kosherim, of separation. They may be saying, look, Jesus, we're Jews. We're in a Gentile place. And by the way, sometimes when you read the word Gentile, you should read the word unclean in their world. How in the world can we get food without defiling ourselves? How can we get food without, without entering into this unclean circumstance? Modern liberal scholars may reject the authority or the content of the scriptures, but I accept the claim. And so I, my reason is, no, I, I think that the disciples really still are struggling. They're struggling with prejudice. They're struggling with a world in which they grew up in where people who weren't like them weren't 
easily able to make contact with them. So what seems to be more reasonable? That Jesus is mistaken? That Matthew got it wrong? That he blurs the events of chapter 14 and 15? If Matthew really was a tax collector, if Matthew really worked with facts and figures and numbers, do you really think that Matthew could have gotten the details wrong? And I'm going to suggest to you, I don't think so. Which seems to make more sense to you? The liberal scholars are mistaken or that Matthew is mistaken? And if the liberal scholars are, let's be charitable, mistaken, could the disciples' unbelief be rooted in something deeper, something more problematic? Both Jesus and the disciples, again, are in the Decapolis, Gentile country. Let me just put it in a different perspective for you. Imagine you're in California and you're at Disneyland with your children and your grandchildren. Then you get into the car and you go to Las Vegas. Is Disneyland a little bit different from Las Vegas? Are there going to be things that you could do at Disneyland that you can't do at Las Vegas? It's a different world. John Corson writes, quote, certainly Jesus won't do a miracle here, reasoned the disciples. This is heathen country. Most of the crowd is Gentile. The Lord isn't going to feed these people. Besides that, they've been with us three days. In the Galilee, he fed the crowd after one day. This is the wrong place. These are the wrong people. How are we supposed to provide for this crowd? This might be what one Bible writer calls spiritual amnesia. Our tendency to forget God's ability to help us no matter who we are, no matter where we are. And again, before we're quick to judge the disciples' arrogance and ignorance and prejudice, this might be the perfect opportunity for us to take, again, a look into our own hearts. Is it possible that in our arrogance and ignorance and prejudice, we've forgotten some things that God has done in our life? Let me just be blunt. Has God ever blessed you? Has he ever done something wonderful for you? Has the Lord ever given you a miracle of love, of forgiveness, of grace or healing? Has Jesus ever found you and rescued you from a pit? Has he ever provided a needed hug, a smile, a drink, a meal, the rent? And then there's a fresh circumstance, a fresh crisis. A fresh heat, a fresh need. And you think to yourself, I know that God watched out for me in the past. I know that he cared about me in the past. I know that he was, I sensed his presence in the past. But now I've drifted away. I've neglected my Bible. I've distanced myself from the church, from fellowship. I used to be close to Jesus in the Galilee, but now I'm in the Decapolis or Denver. <laughs> I'm in the wrong place, in the wrong time, with the wrong people to expect anything from God. Nothing's going to happen here. Yes, Jesus provided lunch in the Holy Land. But Jesus isn't going to take care of me in Sin City. When I was reading this, I used to think about God's Diner in Orange County. For me, the place where I would go to get food was Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. 
Chuck Smith was there. And I knew that if I went to church there, if I just simply showed up, I was always going to have fresh bread and real butter. That the worst thing that could ever happen to me if I went to Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa is that if I was empty, I was going to be full. And some of you may have had a similar experience. If you went to churches like I had the privilege of serving at a Calvary Chapel in, in Albuquerque, or some of you may be familiar with, with Greg Laurie in Riverside, or, or Joe Foch in Philadelphia. Fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the ministry, fill it in for where, wherever you need it to be. And you, you're just wondering though, but is there food here? Is there food in Littleton? Is there food in Longmont? Is there any place where I can go and I can get something to eat. But out in the middle of nowhere, far from the normal resources, the disciples are thinking, we don't have any way to meet the need. Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to feed such a great multitude? And it's interesting to me that when they ask Jesus this question, doesn't it sound like a familiar question? Where are we going to go in order to provide so much help for so many people? And Jesus says to them, as well as to you and me, Jesus says, I care about them. Hey, what are we going to do to help? Jesus looks at us and says, I care about him. Hey, where are we going to go? How are we going to make some sort of provision? What are we going to do? Jesus says, look, I care about them. I can provide for them. I want to do something. I have compassion for them. And I'm going to guess something at this point. And that is, is, is it possible? Is it possible that the compassion of Jesus is starting to rub off from Jesus? to his disciples that he's not just simply saying I care about them is it possible it's an invitation that Jesus is extending to them to say I, I want you to care about them too I want you to care the way that I care far off the beaten path far from the normal resources that you're used to having but God still loves you. Jesus still loves you. He has compassion for you. God still cares for you. He's not far from you. The Bible says he's close to the brokenhearted. He's near to those who are crushed in spirit. And then he cares about you. Whether you're in Denver or in the Decapolis and Satan will say, you're not going to get anything from God here. Satan will whisper in your ear, this place and these people have nothing to offer you. And Satan whispers in your ear and Jesus whispers in the other ear, I care about you. I care about your heart and I care about your circumstances and I'm not willing to let you leave empty. So let's see what's on the menu. Bread that's come down from heaven. Living water. Wine that makes the heart glad. But let me ask you a different question. Do you believe that God's blessings are somehow linked to your ability to pay? Or your willingness to obey? Let me just be clear about something. Does God care about us? Yes. Does Jesus want us to obey him? I think that the answer is yes. Clearly, God desires obedience, not in order to receive blessings, but because it's a good idea and it makes total sense to obey the Lord. But this might surprise you. Jesus' compassion and grace isn't linked to your character or conduct. It's linked to his character and conduct. I'm empty and I don't care, Jesus says, but I do care. Hey, I don't deserve a meal. That might be true. But I love you and I care about you. I don't have any way to pay. Jesus says, I know. I'm willing to pick up the tab. 
It's interesting to me. Did you really think that you could make God stop caring about you? Because you've acted foolishly. You've been immature. You've acted like a spoiled person. You've acted like a selfish person. The blind were invited to see and the maimed were made whole. And you may be praying less and you may have, are reading your Bible less and, and you may have kept more for yourself and, and not given as much as you could have. But Jesus sees you and he still cares about you. He sees the emptiness and the hurt and he doesn't want you to stay empty. And so look at the king's command to feed the multitude. In verse 34, Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few fish. And by the way, when it says loaves, don't think King Super's great big Italian loaves or San Francisco sourdough bread loaves. Think muffins. Smaller than an Think pita bread tortillas. Yes, tortilla is not the great big tortilla like you get to wrap at Chipotle and you stuff it full of so much stuff five people can eat from it. Think of the tiny little impoverished tortillas that they give you at McDonald's where they roll it into a little tube and they go, here, eat this. That's what it's talking about. This isn't the big tortilla. This is the little tortilla. When Jesus again asks the ancient question, what do you have? Remember in chapter 14, Jesus wasn't interested in what you don't have. He was interested in what you do have. He wasn't interested in what you were willing to keep for yourself. He was interested in what you were willing to bring to him. In other words, it's asking and answering the question all over again. What are you willing to allow Jesus to make use of in your life? What is it that you're willing to allow Jesus to make use of? Does it have something to do with your brain? Does it have something to do with your heart? Does it have something to do with your mouth? What are you willing to bring to Jesus to allow him to make a difference in people's lives? And you say, I don't have it any money and I say what do you have what do you have a will a heart a predisposition in verse 35 says it says so he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fish and he gave thanks he broke them and gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave it to the multitude again we visited this Jesus commands the multitude to sit down on the ground and I'm going to suggest to you that he doesn't just sit them down on the ground. I'm going to suggest to you that he begins to group them in groups, in groups of 50, in groups of 100, and that he takes his disciples and he establishes a point where each and every disciple can work with the groups in order to provide the most amount of help in the most meaningful way. And this is one of the reasons why we as a church can't be content to just have worship. And I want to have great worship worship or teaching and I want to continue to have great teaching or evangelism and I want to have great opportunities to reach out but somehow fellowship has to become an important part of our church I have to encourage you to get involved in each other's lives to make a meaningful effort to find out what your gifts and callings are so that you can use them one with another. Clearly, in verse 35 and 36, most importantly in verse 36, it says, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and, and I want to draw your attention to just those two simple words in verse 36. He gave thanks. The implication in the text in the original language isn't that he said Hey, thanks, Father, for this food. The way the verb is constructed, it is, he gave thanks. 
And he continued to give thanks. And he continued to give thanks. It's in a continuous tense. It isn't where he just said, thank you, thank you very much. But it was, it, it seems repetitious, a heart of repetitive gratitude as he, as he gives thanks and the, the, the food starts multiplying. And again, Jesus could clearly have multiplied and distributed the food to the people, but he allows the disciples to participate in the process. And the, maybe the most wonderful insight that I could provide for you isn't just simply that Jesus loves you and that he wants to provide for you. The most astonishing thing about this text is he wants to include you. That he wants to include you. And making a difference in other people's lives. In verse 37 it says, So they all ate and were filled. And they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. We already know what this means from chapter 14. Remember this filling is the kind of filling that probably didn't take place often in the ancient world. This is the kind of eating where you go to the Chinese all you can eat buffet. This is where you go and you eat and you eat and you eat so that you can't eat anymore so that it so that you in your mind think I'll never eat again. They were filled to the brim. They're full. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this just for a moment. They're full in a place that isn't the Holy Land. And these are Gentiles and not Jews. Undisciplined, but full. Immature, but full. Detached from the normal things that Jewish kids get to grow up with. You might have had a great privilege that your father and mother or your grandfather and grandmother loved the Lord and read you the Bible and told you what's right. And maybe you didn't have that opportunity. Maybe you grew up in a place where you were pretty much morally on your own. But no matter where you are, no matter who you are, Jesus wants to fill you I want you to think about this for just a moment. I'm going to ask you a question. It's a very simple question, and don't overthink it. Why were they full? Because they're where Jesus happens to be giving out food. It's really that simple. If you've ever been with someone and they're sitting at a table and they go, I'll take one of these and 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 you happen to be sitting at the table where the person is ordering unlimited food, all you have to do is open your mouth. They happen to be in the place where Jesus was giving out food. You don't have to stay empty when there's plenty of places where Jesus is giving out food. And by the way, it's just, just as for you Bible students and scholars, Matthew uses a different word here in this chapter for basket in the earlier chapter 14. In the previous feeding of the 5,000, he uses the word kofinos, which is a word that meant like a lunch bag or a small bag. It's the kind of bag that you would use to take your lunch in. Here, Jesus uses, or Matthew uses the term Spiritos. The reason why this is important is spiritos is a Greek word that represented a container that was as big as a man. It's the same word that's used in the book of Acts by Luke when, when Paul is running for his life and he has to get into a spiritos. It's a, it's a basket and they lower him from the city wall. In other words, we're talking about a basket that is so big that a human being could actually stand in it. Alfred Edersheim observes, quote, the Lord ended each phase of his ministry with a feeding. He ended the ministry in the Galilee with the feeding of the 5,000. He ends the ministry in the Gentile area with the feeding of the 4,000. He ends the Judean ministry before his death on the cross 
with the feeding of his own in the upper room. Do you know what the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the, of the disciples all have in common? None of them were worthy. None of them deserved what Jesus was willing to give. And so the only requirement, come. In verse 38, now those who ate were 4,000 besides men, women, and children. This means that the figure swells way beyond 4,000. If there's just one woman and one child for each man, do the math. That's 12,000 people. He exercises love and compassion because he's loving and compassionate. And in order to participate in the miracle, they're not exercising faith. They're not solving profound theological problems. They simply show up. They simply eat. They're at the king's diner where you get grace and mercy and forgiveness and nourishment and hope. The anointing and the spirit didn't just simply drift. It wasn't because they were having a miracle crusade in the Galilee and now they're having a miracle crusade in the Decapolis. Let me just be blunt here. The miracle takes place in the place where Jesus is. No wonder Jesus himself says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to bind up the brokenhearted, to open the prison doors for those who are, are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It says, in the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. They, so that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, and so that he would be glorified. The greatest joy, the greatest satisfaction, the greatest privilege, the greatest grace, the greatest mercy can come simply by being with Jesus. God can bless when we fast and pray, but God can bless even when we don't fast and pray. God can bless when our spouse has cancer, when our child is sick, when the rent's not paid, when the pain seems greater than we can bear. And often the Lord in his mercy and his compassion will simply say, I see you. I understand your circumstances and your pain. And I want to give you exactly what you need. You know, I experienced God's love and mercy and forgiveness in a tent in Southern California when I was 16 years old. The greatest experience of my life with Jesus is when I showed up one day not wanting help, not wanting hope, not looking for a savior, not even thinking that I, there was a, even the slightest chance that I could ever be forgiven. And then like manna from heaven and living water being gushed out, I discovered that a real Jesus was really willing to help somebody like me. In order to experience Christ's compassion, you have to experience Christ. You have to be with Jesus. In verse 39, when it says, he sent the multitude away and he got into the boat and he went to the region of Magdala, he will dismiss the crowd and then he will return to the Galilee. He will close the service. But I guarantee you that everyone who wanted to got everything that they needed. 
Just quickly, seven lessons from the King's Diner. We don't have time to dwell on these, but let me just give you a couple of things to think about. Number one, only at the King's Diner can you eat something for nothing. That's exactly right. You've heard the expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch. At the King's Diner, there really is. Jesus is willing to pick up the tab for your salvation. Jesus didn't take an offering. He didn't hand out buy one, get one free coupons. Can you imagine Jesus going, here, disciples, look, buy one fish, get one free. Buy one loaf of bread, get one free. He doesn't do that. Only God can make something out of nothing. Only God could have made the earth and the sea and the grain and the fish that live in the water. Only God could keep his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and raise Jesus from the dead. That's what God does. Number two, at the king's diner, you not only eat, but you're required to serve. Can you imagine going to a restaurant where you go, look, I'm going to give you everything that you want and everything that you need. But when you're done, here's what I want you to do. I want you to push yourself from the table and I want you to put on an apron and I want you to start helping others. You don't do that in order to eat. You do that because you have eaten. Jesus cares about the multitude and his ultimate goal is to bring people into a right relationship with the God of the universe. The disciples of Jesus eat, but they also serve those who are also eating. We as disciples are required to minister to temporal needs and physical needs, but in the end to lead people and point them to the supplier of every need. You don't have to worry about saving a single soul. You can't. Only Jesus can save people. Only Jesus can heal people. Only Jesus can forgive people. Only Jesus can provide eternal life. <laughs> there was a man named John Wanamaker, who was the founder of a very famous line of department stores. He was also a Christian, and he once took a trip to China to observe the mission that was taking place in China. And a group of Christian brothers and sisters had begun building a church, but they didn't have the money to complete the project. And in a nearby field, he noticed the strange sight of a boy who was yoked with an ox. And as they pulled the plow, one boy and one ox, it was held by the father. And Mr. Wanamaker's guide explained that that little boy had made a promise to his father. He said, if you will sell one of the oxen and give the money to the church, I'll pull the plow. And it said that Mr. Wanamaker fell to his knees and said, Lord, let me be hitched to a plow that I may know the joy of sacrificial giving. That is sacrificial giving. Number three, at the king's diner, you eat and worship. Jesus had an unqualified compassion. He healed their bodies, but he also filled their stomachs. And most of the pagan Gentiles in the Decapolis were idol worshipers. They were sinners. These were not people who were going to pull up stakes and leave the Decapolis and then flood into Israel. They were going to probably still have some problems. And they were going to probably still have some needs. But when the crowd saw the miracle power of Jesus and the multiplication of the food, they worshipped God because they knew that something supernatural was happening. And number four, at the king's diner, they rely on heavenly, divine, supernatural resources. At the king's diner, you don't bring your own steak. This isn't a bring your own bottle or bring your own lunch. You show up and Jesus gives you what he has. Clearly you bring what you have and you give what you have. And you may think that your resources aren't sufficient to feed yourself, but earthly resources cannot provide heavenly food. Clearly we give and we receive 
But again, only Jesus can give the food that abides and remains where you're no longer hungry. And number five, at the king's diner, God's resources are never diminished or exhausted. Everyone ate that day. No one was left out. Everyone ate until they were satisfied. Number six, at the king's diner, no matter how much it costs, you always get more than you put in. You always get more. When the disciples gave all that they had to Jesus, they had seven full baskets remaining for themselves. You know what that means? What this means is, it sounds cliche, but it's really true. You can't outgive God. No matter what you give him, he'll always give you more. And one of the things that I saw in the text that I hadn't seen, number seven, at the king's diner, the king always sits with you. Have you ever gone out with a very large crowd and somebody was the celebrity? And everybody wanted to sit with the celebrity. But when you go out with Jesus, he always sits right next to you. It's interesting to me. Compassion isn't restricted to that one meal. It's available for every meal. And the king's compassion is always on the menu. Compassion for everything that we need. Jesus has compassion on the Jews and the Gentiles, on the sinners and the saints, on the selfish and the selfless, on the Republicans and the Democrats. I, 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 wait, I'm gonna, let me take that out of the notes. <laughs> he has compassion on the silly and the serious and the self-sufficient. Paul tells the Galatians, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And our compassion isn't measured by our feeling, but by what we really do. By what we really do. So I'm going to have Lindsay come out. I want you to take your elements. We're going to have communion here in just a moment. But as we do, and as we dismiss, I just want to remind you of something. Remember what the Bible says, that he took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples. It says he took a cup, and he gave it to them, and he said, take this and drink it, all of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and the, of the everlasting covenant, which will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus feeds us with exactly what we need. But the most important thing that he could ever give to us was the sacrifice that he made. These elements represent that sacrifice. And you'll notice something. What they both have in common, they're both crushed. You have to crush the grain in order to make the bread. And you have to crush the grape in order to make the juice or the wine. Don't be surprised if God has to break you, crush you, so that you'll be available, not just simply to him, but to each other. Let's pray. And while Lindsay's uh, singing this song, you partake of the, of the communion elements. Heavenly Father, we do commit this time to you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, the compassion that caused him to not just simply give almost everything, but everything, so that we could have the one thing that we needed most, hope, forgiveness, grace, mercy, and love. Lord, prepare our hearts as we partake of these elements. Lord, remind us, fill our hearts with the knowledge of what we can do to make life a little bit easier for each other. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. Lindsay.